Wow. Yeah. Here we go. All right. So last time we uh, started to move from like from the concept of exposure and hazard modeling to the vulnerability. So the first thing that we did when we started this series of lectures is um, is hazard and then modeling communities. If you guys remember, we had this community of Galveston, Texas, and we put the wind hazard map on the buildings and we extracted the wind speed at each building. The second thing is, once I know the wind speed, like for a, for a specific building here, you got a wind speed 50 meter per second or 70 mile per hour. What is the potential damage that this building is going to have? And we need to do this in a way that can tell what is the, 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 the vulnerability of all the buildings within the community. So we need a coding that goes building by building and take all the information about this building. Is it residential or commercial? What is the roof shape? What is the foundation type? What is the construction material? And all this information is going to tell me what is the building archetype of each one of these buildings. Once I identified the building archetypes, I showed you I showed you guys last time a paper. Actually, there's lots of papers about the fertility. You can pick whatever you would like. Maybe you are looking at uh, industrial building. So you will find a paper that developed a fragility function for industrial building. And then you bring it and then use it. And we stopped last time on how we identify the vulnerability of each one of these buildings. And last time I did something. So I told you, actually, we had the fragility paper. Most of the fragility papers tells you the fragility as a function of lambda and xc. It tells you the log normal parameter. These are the log normal. So what I'm doing right now, I'm teaching you when you are reading a paper on wind vulnerability analysis using fragility, what do you exactly need from this paper? So you go to the paper, getting the fragility parameters, and if you are looking at damage states, so you will have parameters for damage state one, two, three, and four. So you'll have damage state one, damage state two, damage state three, damage state four. The second step is I want to convert these parameters to fragility curves. So, so the second thing is I want to get this curve. So what we do is we use MATLAB and we use the log normal CDF function with these parameters. And we calculate the, the exceedance probability at a specific wind speed. So this function, you get this function, these parameters, so input is lambda and xc. So these are the various two inputs, the log normal CDF parameters. And the, the third input is the wind speed at each point. So the thing is, here's the wind speed V on the x-axis, and here is the prob probability of exceedance. I want to know what is the probability of exceedance at each wind velocity. So you get the wind velocity to this function, the log normal CDF with lambda and xc. Let's say that we have wind velocity 40. The log n CDF will give you the probability of exceedance of 40. So what we did last time, we entered a series of wind speeds, like calculate the exceedance probability for wind speed starting from zero up to 100 meter per second with a step of 0 0.01. So I will calculate a 0 0.01 meter per second, 0 0.02 until 100. So you will end up with having a thousand, thousand, actually maybe 10,000 if it's 0.0, I believe it was 0.1, not 0.01. So if you have 0 0.1, so you will end up with having x, y values, x value is the wind speed. This is the output. This x is the wind speed v, and y is the exceedance probability, probability of exceedance. 
And this will be probability of exceedance of damage in state one if you enter the parameters of damage in state one, like lambda one and xc one. Here you'll have lambda two and xc two, lambda three and xc three, lambda four and xc four. And this was evident from the paper that we have from our last time. This paper. So this paper is one of the papers on wind fragilities and actually you can search like, because this paper is, is not the one that has developed all these fragilities, like bunch of researchers did and this paper collected all these fragilities in one. But if you go on Google Scholar here and you just searched wind fragility, just like checking. So here is a paper that has do fragility assessment only for roof sheathing, not for the entire building. Fragility assessment of flight frame wood construction. So you can subject it to wind and earthquake um, of analysis of steel and concrete wind turbine. So you'll find residential buildings. Okay. Let's check this one. So this is a paper that has wind performance enhance, enhancement strategies for residential wood frame buildings. Let's go down and see what they have. So here's the same concept. They put the, the wind pressure equation. And then here's the building archetypes that we were talking about. This is archetype one, two, three, four. They have five residential building archetypes. And finally, they put the damage state criteria and the uh, uncertainty parameters and the wind speed and the wind pressure coefficients and all of these parameters. And here they have kind of mitigation, like they are saying, okay, we will try different combination of parameters and see how this will impact the fragility. Like let's say mitigation number one, rather we are gonna use asphalt shingles and we are gonna use roof sheathing with nailing pattern, this one. And this one has a roof to wall connection to uh, two toenails or a hurricane clip or two hurricane clips. So in this paper, they are really investigating when the fragilities, but in different flavor. Rather than developing fragilities, how about I will investigate enhancement or retrofitting strategies? What if I'm going to use a different, rather than a scout shingles, I'm going to use clay tiles on the roof? Uh, rather than putting uh, different types of nailing, I will increase the nailing. Rather than each 12 inches, I'm gonna put eight nails each six inches. Uh, rather than uh, two, rather than putting nails for the roof to wall connection, I'm gonna use hurricane clip or two hurricane clips and see how this is gonna impact the fragility. So basically, once you go down, Let's see the fragility. So here's the fragility curves. Definitely they should have parameters. Not sure if they have parameters. Oh yeah, here we go. So here's the fragility parameters for each construction type, damage state one, two, three, and four. So that's what I'm talking about. Most of the fragility papers, they will give you log normal parameters so that you can build these fragilities on your own. And that's what we are doing here right now. So. What we did in our MATLAB code last time, if you guys remember, we uh, we imported the wind fragility parameters. We had them in Excel file, like open outside MATLAB. We had them like this, and these are the fragility parameters for 19 wind archetypes. 
like damage, damage state one, two, three, up to four, with the lambda, the logarithmic mean, and the logarithmic standard deviation. And the next step is to calculate the exceedance probability for each wind speed from zero to 100 meter per second for each archetype, for each damage state for each archetype. This is R, the three parameters. So M is the wind speed, this one. I is the, um, is the built-in archetype. K is the damage state. The minute, so three loops inside each other for each wind speed, like zero, one, two, three, up to 100. For each archetype, one up to 19. For each damage state, one to four. And that's what this business that is doing for each one of these. All right, so as I told you, this function is gonna develop x, y values. This one has V, this one has damage of state one. We are gonna have one, another one for damage of state two, another one for damage of state four, another one for, yeah, I'm sorry, one, two, three, and four. And this only for one archetype. Let's assume this is archetype one. So what we do is we plot these on, X, Y, like you will find, you will end up with having these fragility, something, these points, something like this, All right? Since they are low normally fitted, so it shouldn't be like this. If it's the row fragility, this are low normally fitted, so you'll end up with having your fragility something like this. But if they are row, row I mean like before fitting, before you fit them, it should be something like this, the points, something like this. Let me show you how it looks like from for flood fragility. It should be like these are fragilities for flooding and these, the dotted one is the fragility before you fit them log normal, like they are dotted like this. Then you do a log normal fitting. So it will fit a function that best describes this curve and develop the log normal parameter for you. So most of the waivers are log normally fitted fragility functions. All right, yeah, so, um, so here is the one where, where we calculated all the exceedance probability of each damage estate. Do you guys remember last time we tried to plot them and we were not able to plot them? So I restart my computer and I, retry to plot them and I end up with having 19 figure. So I have figure one. So this are the fragility for archetype one. And I have also all the 19, like this is two. Let's, some damage state are very close to each other. And let's open this archetype. Yeah, this one is not close. So here, as you can see, 14. As you can see here, I have damage state one, two, three, and four. So let's go here. All right, let's assume that these are the four damage states that we have. So this archetype, sorry, this is damage state one. And these fragilities, like if you enter here at 25 and you go all the way up here, you will get the exceedance probability of damage of state one. Let's assume that this is point. So this is exceedance probability of damage of state one. Here, if you, if you hit this point, you will get the exceedance probability of damage of state two, because this curve, 
is damage of state one. This curve is damage of state two. This curve is damage of state four. This curve is damage of state three. Same thing here. Damage of state three. And same, same thing here, damage of state four. And that this makes sense. Like at very low wind speed, we have we always have higher probabilities for the the like light damage states rather than the extensive or complete damage states. So at this wind speed, you have a high probability of damage state one, less probability of having damage state two, less probability of damage state three, and damage state four. However, at some point when you reach a very high wind speed, like 100 miles, 100 meter per second. So here is damage of state four is 100% exceeded. If damage of state four is 100% exceeded, that means that all the other damage of states are also 100% exceeded. So this is what we get from this curve. Also, sometimes we are interested in the probability of being in a damage of state. Like you get here, and then you are not interested at the exceedum because if we are saying that damage state two were exceeded, like the building exceeded damage state two, if it exceeded damage state two, it's already exceeded damage state one. Okay, because if you are saying the building has extensive damage state, so you already exceeded slight and moderate damage state, and you reach it damage state three. But what we are interested to, what is the probability of having damage state four? We need to know all the probabilities. So you check the probability of being in each damage state. This one, this one, this one, and this one. And we need to assign only one damage state to each building. So for example, this one is the bigger, and this one is damage state three. So we assign damage state three to this building. So let's see how that's why we stopped that last time. So let's get to the MATLAB code. And that's what we were calculating. Yeah, this is the code. All right, so last time we um, we loaded our building points and we extracted the wind archetype and also the wind speed. And uh, I told you that I had to adjust the wind archetype if some building doesn't have an archetype assigned, I have to assume an archetype. So any building that has zero archetype, that means we cannot identify this archetype. So we assign archetype one or we remove them from the analysis. Then we did interpolation. As I told you, the interpolation was doing if you, for example, if I have wind speed one, two, three, four, up to 100, and then I get the exceedance probability like 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.12, sorry, 0 0.17, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, three, lots of numbers. What I, what I, what is this function is doing this interpolation? You give it the x, y coordinate, the wind, and the exceedance probability. And the wind speed at each building, and it do interpolation between the nearest point, and it tells you what is the exceedance probability of this building. And this is what this function is doing. You interpolate, you give this function the y coordinates and the x coordinates. And with the new x coordinates, the new velocity, and it tells you what is the new exceedance probability. So we do it for damage state one, two, three and four. So basically we get the exceedance probability of each one of these buildings. Okay, so this is exceedance probability. What if we are looking for the probability of being in a damage state? How can we get that? If you have the exceedance probability of damage state one and the exceedance probability of damage state two, you subtract them so that you can get the probability of being in a specific damage state. So here is what it, this is what this function is doing. So what I do is, let me ask you, what if I want to get the probability of being in damage state one, being not exceeding? What would be the function? This one minus the exceedance probability of damage state one, because this is one, 
And then you subtract one from this, subtract this from one, and you get this part. But if you want to get the exceedance probability of being in damage state, sorry, this is no damage. This is damage state one, damage state two, damage state three, damage state four. So let's say that this is 97% exceedance of damage state one. How about the 3%? So if it has 97% exceedance of damage state one, it has 3% of non-exceedance, which is no damage. So there is 79% of exceedance, but there is a 3% of no damage. And then here, out of the 97% damage exceedance, there is some coming from damage state one, some coming from damage state two, some coming from damage state four, and also very small amount coming, coming from this damage state, all right? So what we want to do in this part of the code is to identify the probability of being P in a damage state for when. So the first one was one minus damage state one, and then you do it one by one until you get to the last damage state, this one. For the last one, it basically, the exceedance probability is the same as the probability of being in each damage state, this one, because there is no another damage state to subtract from. So that's why you put it as is. All right, so once I'm done with this part, okay, right now I calculated the probabilities of being in each damage state. The next step is, what is the damage state of the building? Okay, if I'm telling you, for example, I make a line here, and you are getting this value, this value, this value, and these values. First, I told you that this value is like 0.35, this value is 0.45, this value is like 0.15, this value is 0 0.05. So basically, you need to get the maximum, which is 0.45, and this is what this function is doing. First, I calculate the maximum of these four values or five values. And then once I get the maximum, I need to identify which column of these has the maximum. Which one has the, you will identify the maximum. Like MATLAB will not, is not smart enough to know which one of these you'll have to write a code that tell, that tell the MATLAB or the MATLAB can do so that it can tell me is it damage state one the maximum or damage state two the maximum or damage state three is the maximum? So what this is what this function is doing. Like I ask MATLAB, find the column and the row that has the, the probability, the maximum, which is this one, equal to any one of these. Like I identify the maximum. Tell me is the maximum here or here or here or there? If it's here, so it's damage state four. It's here, so it's damage to state three. So this is what this piece of code is telling me. What where is the maximum? Find where is the maximum, which is the column number five. Column number five has the maximum value. It's kind of like programming thing. Okay, I identified the maximum. The second thing, so right now I'm done with my analysis. I calculated the exceedance probability of each damage state for each building the probability of being in each damage state and what damage state is each building. Next is I want to write this data in a new shape file. Do you guys remember I have the shape file doesn't have any results. I want to put my results on the main shape file. This is, is the part of the code that do this. I'm asking MATLAB for the same shape file. I want to map my points to S1, S1 is the, is the original shape file that I defined here, this one. For the original shape file, can you write me the new data inside the same original MATLAB file, the original shape file, and then add these columns. Column one has the probability of damage state one, two, three, and four, and then another four columns that has the exceedance probability, so I have N here, for damage state one, two, three, and four. And finally, the last column will be, what is the damage state for each building? And you run your code. But when you run this code, 
make sure to rename the shape file so that you don't mess with the original shape file. So I make a shape write, write a new shape file that has this data and has the same name of the file, except I will add at the end damage because I did damage analysis. And once you run it, you will get this new shape file, Galveston County building points damage. And I save the time and I run this code so it doesn't take from our lecture time. So when I want to load this result, so let's go to uh, MATLAB. You, here's our classes. Turn nine, MATLAB point damage analysis. Yeah, and here's the result, this file. And then I will put this file here. Okay, so the green points, so this message is telling me there is no spatial reference for this data. So since it's coming from MATLAB, it doesn't have any reference. So you can keep them or you can add a projection to this data. And I told you, how can we do this? Like, here's the point. It's the green points here on the top of the red one. It doesn't have any projection, but if you want to assign a projection to these points, you can from the arc toolbox. Like, let me click on this data. Still loading. Okay, so if I go to properties, you will find that there is no coordinate system for this data. If you want to add a coordinate system, so basically you will go to data management tool, sorry, data management tools, and then you will find projection and transformation and define projection. You basically click on this one and you add the data that doesn't have projection and you choose the coordinate system that you want to project this data on. Right here. And as we agreed last time, we will basically use the WGS 1984. Then I will say, okay, okay. So right now my data has a projection. If you Click properties. And then you will find that this data that has a geographic coordinate system, which is WGS uh, 1984. Okay, let's check what is inside this data. Open attribute table. The new table will have the results that we have done this one, I go all the way to the back. So here you will find that we have damage state one, right? I think this one doesn't have all the results. It has just a bunch of them. So I have damage state one, two, three, but it doesn't have the other three, but anyway, I mean, like when you run this code, it will take some time to like run the entire code. But here I have only four of them. Like I have damage state one when, damage state two when, three. But let me do one check at field. Because I have this code developed like a long time ago. So, uh, I just want to know if this is exceedance or something else like check. Field calculator. Let's uh, sum all these like damage state one plus damage state two plus damage state three plus the image of state four. Uh, 
because I remember when I developed this code, I didn't add this piece, the one that calculates the probability of being in a damaged state. I only stopped maybe I think at the damaged state. So I'm not sure if this is exceedance or the probability of being in a damaged state. So I'm doing like a, a check to see. So the check, just a check actually is doing, if these probabilities are exceedance, like this one, and this one and this one, and I'm summing exceedance probability definitely will give me number more than one. But if I'm summing all of these numbers and they are giving me a number less than one or equal to one, that means like the art probability of being in a damaged state. So let's, okay. So looks like it gives me, all of them are equal to one. Can you see guys? When I sum all of these, it gives, all the numbers are like almost equal to one. So this number is weird, like it has a little bit over one, but they are, I believe it's kind of like accuracy ratio. Like when, like in the third number, when they round, so you will find that you have some numbers at the third rounding or the second rounding. So, but all of them are almost, or all of them are equal to one. That means that these are probability of being in a damaged state. Okay, so and this one Okay, so here we go. And this one is the damage state for each building. It closed the box. So can you see here? I have damage state four with probability of being in damage state four 63%, and damage state one 21%, and this one is, is 10%. So this is one is the biggest. So this building is damage state four, four. Same thing. So so if you want to visualize this on your map, so basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this point, like my shape file here. And I'm going to color code these buildings based on their damage state. So I will click on, on the shape file, or basically you make a right click and hit properties. And then you will go to symbology. And here's the symbology is just a single point. It puts all the points with one color, which is a single point and green. What we are gonna do right now is a, is a categories. Like we are gonna put these buildings into categories and I will ask ArcGIS to, to make a category based on the building damage state. So I will add all the values. So here he found only four numbers. Make sure that when you make categories, you have like very small categories because you don't like category. Maybe you can category the building based on their area, but you will have to put ranges of these areas, not single number, because definitely each, each building has different area. So you put a range of this area. Here, I only have four damage states. That's why I have four numbers shown here. Um, we can increase uh, the size of the... Uh, of the point, like to make it like a little bit bigger so that we can see maybe something like this. Let's change this green, maybe blue, so that it can be distinguished from the other green. So I have all the four points, say apply, okay. Here. Okay, so here, let me make, um, so right now, most of the building that we can visualize here, either red or orange, that means most of the buildings in this location got damage state one or damage state two. There is no damage state three and four, but let's zoom to the entire layer to see where are the building that has damage state four, which is the, the highest damage state. Okay, so what I'm gonna do right now, because I can see the blue building, uh, the 
I'm gonna zoom in to the buildings that has zoom to select it. So these buildings are damaged state four. So yeah, can you see here these buildings? Yeah, these buildings, the blue one. So here I was able to find damage state three, damage state blue, blue. Uh, sorry, damage state four, which is blue. I have some red. Uh, let's put the wind speed map here and see what is how was the wind speed at these buildings. So let's click on this map. Where did the map go? Okay, so here it's reading. Okay, so the wind speed was almost 40 meter per second. If you want to know how is 40 meter per second in terms of miles per hour, let's put 40. So it's almost like 90 mile per hour, which were very high in wind speed. So damage to state four is like kind of reasonable and also depends on the building type. But this is how we do vulnerability analysis. And actually flood is almost the same. And I'm gonna show you maybe in the next lecture or so how we do vulnerability analysis for flooding, but it's the same thing. You do hazard modeling, you get the hazard map, you develop your building inventory, you identify the building, uh, you identify the uh, hazard intensity at each building, you do a MATLAB code that make the hazard intensity as an input to a fragility function, and it tells you what is the damage is. And you do this for each building and you get the exceedance probability, the probability of being in each damage state and the damage state of each building. And that's it. So, uh, you guys, question. yeah. So in, in this particular case now, we, we have the potential of seeing a paper that had different building archetypes, and then we use that for this analysis. So in the case where you want to combine both wind and, and water damage, for example, yeah. how do you then marry it if they have different yeah, well, that, that's a good, actually, I published the paper of this, but it's kind of, I, I might teach it in this class if we have time after I do the flood part, but basically, you will have to identify what components that are going to be damaged by flood and what components that are going to be damaged by wind. And actually, to be honest, these wind fragilities only assess the damage for specific components. Like, if you look on, if you read the, the paper in detail on the, on the fragility development, they only develop fragility for windows doors, roof framing and sheathing, and I believe maybe the framing. So these fragilities only measure the damage for the building envelope. It doesn't measure the damage what happened inside the building. So these fragilities only can measure these, that's fine. But if you are calculating loss analysis for the entire building based on these fragility, this will be misleading because these fragility only tells the damage for a specific component. That's why you, will, you want to be careful when you are using fragility functions for building, you will have to look for what components has been included in this fragility. And based on this, you identify the cost of these components and you calculate the total cost. And then once you include the total cost of these components with this fragility, this fragility can inform the losses based on these components, not the entire building. Let's combine flooding. So the flood fragilities that I developed only account for content, structural, and non structural account for the entire building. But flooding, static flooding, usually doesn't have impact on the structure. Like let's assume the water is going up. Usually this water is not gonna fill the building unless there has foundation scour or something like this. You will have structure there. But usually impact what? Very content, like uh, non-structural component, furniture, appliances, uh, drywalls, insulation, uh, electrical and mechanical items, 
all of these get impacted by flooded. So you will have to separate what components are going to be impacted by flooding, what components are going to be impacted by wind. And actually, there will be some components that will be impacted by both. So for example, if we are talking about not static flooding, dynamic flooding coming like a surge and wave. Surge is like static flooding. Wave is the one that causes structural damage. So usually, the waves make, make damage to the walls and the foundation, but doesn't make damage to the roof because of the, the top. Wind causes damage to the roof and the walls. So right now, we have one common component, the walls. Walls sometimes get damaged from wind and also sometimes get damaged from the surge. So you will have to find a way to find the impact, the combined impact of both. So you either develop a, a high resolution model that can model both hazards real time and develop fragilities for both. But this sometimes may, may be theoretical because maybe the maximum from the wave will not happen with the maximum of wind. And actually this sometimes like, like when we design for seismic, we doesn't say that the maximum wind speed will happen with the maximum seismic. So we deal with them like the maximum is not gonna happen at the same time because this will be a really, really extreme event. So if it if it's this case, assuming that post maximum is not going to happen at the same time, like wind speed maximum is going to happen first, and then you will be hit with the surge. So you can basically find. Let's assume that the wind speed hit first. You will get the damage state for the wall, and then it's damage state one. Then you try to see how much damage state this wall is going to have from the water. It will have three. So is the final damage state one or three? So it will be three. So basically you can isolate them and see which one is gonna cause the maximum. And then you pick the maximum one. So this is a one way to do it. However, it will be much more uh, accurate if you started, but this will be very, very complicated. It could be a good research idea. If you have your building first, you will calculate how much damage it will have for the wind and then you identify the damage state, and then you start from this damage state to the next damage state. So you will not have to deal with your component as not damaged, like it's like uh, fully functional, and then you start to hit it with the water. You start from where the wind goes the damage. So, but it's, it's, it's really complicated and you cannot control it. Maybe there is a way that you can control it. I'm, I mean, like, it's like you can do research and see how you can, because when we do community level analysis, maybe their analysis doesn't have that impact. Like, okay, I will, I will do it separately. Like, uh, because if I studied both them at the same time, it will be much more complicated. It's worth research, but I don't, I don't have this time to do this research now. So you do it in the simple way. So this is kind of way to uh, think about it. Yeah. All right. So, uh, okay. So this is for wind damage. Does any of you have any question related to this? All right. So right now I'm done with the uh, wind part. So one of the homeworks that I'm going to give you after the spring break, I'm going to give, I'm not sure if I will give you the MATLAB code, but it's recorded on the screen. I believe that you should write it by yourself so that you get familiar with how we do all of these things. You can watch it in the video. All what you do, you see what are the MATLAB code piece that we used and write it and run the code and see if it's working or not. So this is maybe a one way to develop what we developed here. Maybe I give you the same files. Maybe I give you another city like Waveland, Mississippi with different wind or different hazard and do the same thing, okay? So this is just like kind of practice and this will be helpful for your project. Just like get your hands on MATLAB and um, to write the code by yourself. I can give you the code, but you will just run it so you will not learn. So write it and I believe that you will learn a lot. Okay, so the next thing that I'm gonna do today, does any of you have issues or something? Because this one uh, is not good. All right. Diana. All right. Thanks. So is this stuff difficult? Like difficult? 
Really? You see the cold? Everything's that cold? I don't think cold. But, but this is this doesn't have statistics. No, I, I mean the whole course. Okay, the other part I agree with you is difficult. But when we hit with the hazard exposure vulnerability, is that difficult? I, I, I agree with you. Like it was to be honest, to be honest, the statistics part and the part that grace was difficult for me when I get it, but I have to study so that I can be good. But this part I believe is not difficult. Like it's basically you have a hazard map, a raster map, and I told you what is this map is, and then you have a bunch of buildings, and we put them over each other, calculate the wind speed, get this wind speed in a fragility function, get the damage. That's it. Just think about it as easy as that. And all the other thing is just a bunch of coding that can facilitate all your analysis. And I'm telling you this, uh, what I'm telling you like in, in like five minutes or 20 minutes, I have done, I spent lots of months developing the codes, the hazard maps. So I'm giving you all of this in just like have 30 minutes. Nobody tell me how to do it. Nobody uh, guided me how to do them step by step but I'm telling you how to do this step by step. Maybe in your research, you can find the hazard map directly. You don't have to develop it. Like you search for the wind hazard map for Hurricane Ian, and then you get it. And you search for the building inventory for uh, Fort Myer Beach, and then you get the buildings. And then you put them together in ArcGIS, you get the wind speed at each building. As easy as that. And actually this is step, believe me, if you familiarize yourself with ArcGIS, it take like few minutes. You get the hazard map from some people, developers who develop the hazard, when the hazard maps or search hazard maps, and the building inventory is out there. You combine them together, you will identify the wind speed at each building. So this is the easy part. The most difficult part, which is what we do as a engineers is to get the damage. And I told you what is the fragility is doing. Fragility is just a simple function. It tells you, just tell me what is the wind speed and I will tell you what is the damage. That's it. If you like, just like the functions of MATLAB could it just like do some interpolation to get you what is exactly the damages. That's what it do. And I believe this is simple, but I agree with you. The other stuff is different. It's not easy. We'll need to work a little bit. But this one, just put your hands on the MATLAB and all the stuff there, it will be very easy. It will not be that difficult. And this one will distinguish you between other people who doesn't know these things because this is catastrophe model. At the community level, because when we do when we say catastrophe, it's like not at the building level, it's at the community. So you will have to be a catastrophe model, you will have to pay the price. You will have to learn MATLAB, learn ArcGIS, do spatial data analysis, because this is catastrophe model. So I teach you in a, like in a lecture or two, but you will have to put some work on. You'll have to go learn. So it's not, yeah, it will be difficult if you didn't like put some effort to learn. But it will be very easy if you put something. So that's that can be practice, but then the statistics part. Again, yeah, but you will have to have basic statistics in math, like mm. in the math faculty, mm. and not even there, they made it this difficult. Like it was very applicable. Me, I made it very, very easy and I did it give you guys the hardest one. Like the, the main course of the risk overall risk and reliability is very big was lots of complex stuff. I just like eliminated most of this stuff and gave you this stuff, mm -hmm. the easy stuff. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, no, actually, this is the buildings that, that I selected. Oh, this one, like when I clear my selection, because the selected building will have the, uh, this color. When I clear my selection, it will pick up. So these are the buildings points. Yeah, so it's only the four colors, the red, orange, green, and Right, so right now we will move to a different topic. Uh, we will spend like the last 20 minutes introduction to flood hazard. So I don't want you to be a flood expert. I'm not a, like that flood expert, but I know the basics, how the flood models is being developed. I'm a flood expert, but in the specific things like flood vulnerability, I know some, I have to build some hydrology background on all of these things that I'm gonna tell you, how is the process look like? Uh, so, for flooding, like the flood is start by, how's the flood start? 
No, how's the water start? So rain, right? So it started with rain. So basically, we'll have some rain here, like some clouds, and these clouds will drop some rain. Okay. So here, when the, the flooding starts. So the problem is when this rain hit the ground, we need to know how much of this rain fall on the ground. How much? How much go deep into the equation? And the project will be on the flood hazard model, so you guys need to be a little bit focused. Okay, so you have a bunch of water coming from the rain, falling on the ground. Some of them, this is the ground, will go deep infiltration into the soil, and some of them will be surface. Runoff. Our job is to determine the quantity of the surface runoff. How can we know this? The hydrology guys developed some function. One of them is called CM curve. Curve number, it's called the curve number. This curve number, you entered with a curve number. And this curve number, let's assume that this curve number is 50, and it tells you how much water surface runoff that you will have. This curve number depends on many parameters. Can you imagine these parameters? What parameters that can tell us how much is surface runoff and how much deep infiltration? What do you think? Soil type. Soil type. Slope. 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 Roughness. Land use. Lots of information about. So all of this, it's kind of map. You will have a soil map, a land use map, a digital elevation map, combine them together, and each pixel have a number. You combine all these numbers together to get this curve number. I'm not gonna tell you in details. It's a very, very long process, but this is in general. And then you end up with having a curve number based on all the soil and land information, and it tells you how much is the Q. And then once we know the Q, and this process is called hydrologic analysis, like let's say number one, hydrologic analysis. It's a very long process. I'm just like giving you a general idea. It has lots of things, loss methods, routing methods, lots of methods to calculate everything. <laughs> and the most important from this one is to tell you what is the water flow in each stream. So if you have your study area, something like this, and it has few streams, like something, a stream like a river or a creek, something like this, and a big river like that, and some few streams like this. Basically, this curve number will be for each what we call catchment. Like each one of these river, is coming from a water catchment, like a region, catch the water and deliver it to this stream. So from this curve number, tell me how much water will be in this catchment that catch the water and how much of this water is gonna go to the stream. Once I know this, I will be able to know the volume and I will be able to know what is the water flow in each one of these streams. Like this stream, this stream, this stream. And if you have, the water as a function of time, how this water is getting increased or decreased over the time, you will be able to know how much is the, the amount of water is getting decreased or increased over the time in each one of these streams. Once you know the smallest streams, you will know the big streams, this one, okay? And this is what the hydrologic analysis tells us. So basically, this stream will have something like this, and X, Y, here you will have time, and here you will have Q, and you will have a function like this. Something like this. This function tells you how the flow in this stream beaked during the flood hazard and getting down and maybe had another beak from other stream because also the beak time for each stream is very, very important to tell me how much the main stream is performing. For example, what if all these rivers beaked at the same time? 
if they peaked at the same time, the main river will peak at the same time, and will be I will be I will have a very big problem. But the thing is, this is not the case. Maybe this river has a peak and at the peak different from this one, and not all the peaks came together. So the peak time is very very important when it comes to hydrology. But anyway, this is what I'm interested in: the Q over time at each one of the main streams, because when I have a study area. The study area can have hundreds of streams. I'm interested in maybe in this stream, like I'm interested at the end of this stream. How is the water flow at the biggest streams look like? So this is what we do in uh, in hydrologic analysis. The second step is. Is the hydrodynamic analysis. The software that do uh, hydrologic analysis is called the HEC HMS. And actually, there is other software, but I don't remember. There is BC SWIM or SWIM. And there is other software. And hydrodynamic analysis can be done on HECRAS. There's many softwares. HECRAS is one of them. There is also SWIM or BC SWIM. There is, yeah, there is another software here is called WMS. Also WMS. I, uh, so hydrodynamic analysis, there is software that is specialized in riverine flooding. ICRAS is one of them. There is one that do hydrodynamic analysis for coastal flooding. So they might are different. So there's AdCERC. And I believe there is other one. I don't remember the name. But yeah, okay, so let's get to the hydrodynamic analysis. Hydrodynamic analysis use this, the flow hydrograph and the streams, this is small streams, and convert them to flood depth because that's what I'm interested in. Yeah, I know that this flow and, and this running in this streams, but is this flow is gonna fill over, like we're gonna like flood, over flood the community around this stream or not? We need to know this. So that's what hydrodynamic do. So hydrodynamic analysis, let's assume that we have two major streams like this. What I do is I define a boundary condition here at this stream and boundary condition here at this stream. And this boundary condition is the hydrograph. Like this one will have a hydrograph time and Q. And it will be maybe something like this. And this one, let's say that this is boundary condition one, boundary condition two, time, two. And it will have a hydrograph, something like this. Two hydrographs, I put the boundary conditions. And the second thing is I use finite volume or finite element to calculate the water depth. So what I do, you guys, when you, if you guys work on uh, finite element softwares like SAP 2000 ETABs, we do mesh, right? We do finite element mesh to calculate a specific value of interest. Maybe this value is deflection, maybe it's a bending moment, maybe it's something. And it tells you what is the value here based on the finite element calculation. There is other methods, finite volume, do the same thing. So what we do is we do a mesh, like we, Make a mesh on all our study area like this. I make a mesh, maybe I'm interested in this area. And then you develop your finite element or your uh, finite volume mesh. And the mesh will be something like 
will be something like this. On this mesh, you define your boundary condition. Same thing like we do in SAP 2000. We put the loads. This is our boundary condition or our constraint. We put hinges. We put fixations. So this is our boundary condition here. We say that there is amount of water is going over time at this boundary condition. And there is amount of water is going over time at this boundary condition. And solve a specific equation. It's called San Finant equation or shallow water equation. Based on the amount of flows coming here, it will tell you what is the flood depth at each one of these points. What is the flood depth, the flood velocity, and the flood duration at each one of these points? And then it interpolates and it develops a hazard map for you. So this, what the hydrodynamic analysis is doing, is to convert this charges, Q, like flow, into flood depths. And finally, let me sh show you the results. Maybe we will do a more detailed example in one of the next, maybe the next lecture after the break. But you will finally let me show you here. So this is an example. Definitely one of the main inputs for this is the digital elevation map because based on the digital elevation map, it tells you how this flows look like. So for as an input for this is the hydrograph and also the digital elevation map. This is the two inputs, main two inputs, because this flow is gonna flow on the ground. So you need to know what is the ground elevations. Okay, so here it shows you how is my mesh look like. And if I zoom in, Can you see? I have a boundary condition here, like a line. I'm not sure if you guys can see it or not. So let me go to view, view options. Let me remove this file. Yeah, I have a line here. If I click on this line, edit boundary condition line. This is the name, but there is a line here that has a boundary condition because as you guys can see, there is a river here in this area. There's a low, elevation in this area. Same thing, I have also one here, here, there. I identified all my boundary condition and put the water flow at these boundary condition and, and then run the simulation. The simulation can take four days, five days to run and you get results. And finally, you will have some results. So this is actually my study area. And let me show you like how the results look like. When you solve it, it will be something like this. Here's my boundary conditions. One here, up, here, two, three, four, five. I have five boundary conditions because I have five main streams. And this, how is the water is flowing? You guys can see I have one, two, three. Uh, this is not boundary conditions. Well, let, let's see where's the water is coming from. Yeah, can you guys see? One, two, three, four, and five. Five boundary conditions. All of them has water is coming, and since it's sold over the time, it show you how is the water is flowing, and then getting together. And then this is my downstream. It shows how is the water look like. And there is no flooding. Like if, if I zoom in, this is actually the river. Where is the location of the river? Here. So here's, here's my building. So my building is still is not at risk at this time. But as soon as the water is peaking, here's the water is breaching from a location. And then, boom, the flood happened. Okay, so this is the simulation. I'm not interested in the entire simulation. I'm interested in the maximum water depths from all at all times. Like maybe one at the maximum at the start of the simulation and one at the maximum at the middle. I'm interested in the maximum. So you can pick the maximum and it tells you where is the maximum flood depths look like at all time. 
also but it's sometimes it's it's kind of like if you want to know how is the water is flowing let me show you like some cool stuff here yeah so here's it shows you how is the water okay can you see i have a boundary condition up there the water is moving down can you guys see i'm not sure if you guys can you see the, the four white lines the water is moving down and here you have water is coming from here all of them is moving down i have two big streams here this is a small stream look at the water direction because this is the, very important when it comes to hydrodynamic analysis after some time the water is getting increased from the two rivers and if i look at the direction of the water you will find that the water changed direction in one of the streams here it's going up back so this is very important when we do the simulations over time it tells you so it depends on the water flow of these two streams so that's why hydrodynamics is very important because every scenario might be different maybe all of them we're getting water to the downstream, but at some point, the water is going up there. Yeah, so uh, this is kind of like a general overview on how to develop a hydrodynamic simulation, just like not in detail, just from outside. What is the very, the most important step here is to get the hydrograph. Then I get these hydrographs with the digital elevation map, give them to Hedcrest, and then Hedcrest use these two as a boundary condition. And then we develop our mesh and run our model from a specific time to the end of the, uh, the, the, the event. And then we get a hazard map. Sometimes you do your hazard map based on a scenario like hurricane, specific rainfall event after hurricane, or you do it based on return period. Like you can do a hundred year event or a 10 year event. So let's see how's the difference look like. So for example, if you look at the maximum, this is a 200 year event. If I uncheck this and I show the 100 year event, so can you see the maximum here? It's much less with 100 year event. So I only have few water in my in my area like in the residential area if i look at the 50 year event i'm check this what is this okay so this one let me check the flood depths here, 0.73. Definitely there is a problem here. This is a 10 year event. So this one with 10 year event, you basically don't have anything like all the water is just moving in the rivers. Like if I zoom out here, you have a, the river here and just the water is within the river. And I believe the 50 or the 25 should be the same, but maybe there's an issue with this simulation, I'm not sure. Yeah. All right, so this is just the point, like when you have a very high return period event, it's supposed to have like when we have the 200 year and the 100 years, there's an issue with the 50 year. But here's the 100, as we can see, the amount of water is less than the 200 year that we showed in the previous simulation. So I'm gonna send you a video how to take you step by step to develop a wind hazard map. So like on Headcrest, how you open it and I will give you the hazard map and you just, it's a one hour video. 
and I will give you the hydrograph or what you need, these hydrographs and the digital elevation map. And you go follow this video step by step and you can find any video on YouTube. It's a very, very easy process, but you understand how the steps look like. And then you follow them and you can develop a hazard map like this. I believe this will be very important if you develop a hazard map by yourself. It will be very great for you. And maybe for the project, maybe if you develop your own hazard map. All right, so uh, see you guys after the, um, the spring break. And I hope that you guys enjoy your time. And I hope that you all ended your homework. Like uh, if you have any question with the homework, just stop by my office. I will be in my office right now. So if you have any questions, just stop by. Tomorrow, so I will finish up today and then ask you. Okay, yeah, sure. What time is work? Okay, how about? I'm free. Let me stop sharing. <laughs>